Uh, chapter 12, Morality, Religion, and Justice. I, of course, I find all this stuff fascinating, but uh, this is a pretty, pretty fun chapter, for me anyway, uh, because I deal with this. One of the things I need to, to tell you, uh, when it comes to religion, I am not. I'm not a religious person. Uh, I do believe in morality and justice, of course, but uh, I don't have a religious background. Ethnocentrism leads people to assume that their own culture's way ways are better or more natural than that of others. And of course that's exactly what happened when the Europeans first came uh, to the Americas. They, uh, they assumed that uh, they represented civilization and whatever they saw wasn't. Ethnocentrism allowed the Europeans to force their understanding of morality, religion, and justice on all the indigenous people they came across, all in the name of their definition, their definition of civilization. Got the hiccups. In 1971, Lawrence Kohlberg developed his stages of moral development. Level one was pre-conventional level. Level two was the conventional level of morality, and level three was the post-conventional uh, level of morality. Pre-conventional moral reasoning suggests that people interpret morality based on a calculation of how much better or worse off they would be for acting in a certain way. Morality at this level is about trying to behave in a way that provides the best overall return. Pre-conventional morality. Level two, the conventional moral reasoning is about viewing actions as moral to the extent that they help maintain and facilitate the social order. This level dictates that morality is about following the rules, and individuals should not question where, uh, where those rules come from. Post-conventional morality reasoning is based on the consideration of abstract ethical principles of what is right and wrong, and moral decisions are reached based on the logical extensions of those principles. Good behavior is seen as that which is consistent with a set of universal ethical principles that emphasize justice and individual rights. Snary, in 1985, did a meta-analysis of the 27 cultural areas from around the world that had been tested using Kohlberg's parameters. There was some universality in moral reasoning. In all cultures, there were some adults who reasoned at the conventional levels but in no culture, cultural groups did the average adult reason at the pre-conventional level. Evidence of post-conventional moral, uh, moral reasoning was not universally found. Moral reasoning based on justice and individual rights. Every urban western sample contained at least some individuals who showed reasoning based on justice and individual rights. Not a single person from the traditional tribal and village folk populations showed such reasoning. One reason for the discrepancy between traditional societies and more urbane Western societies may be because of the educational experiences of both societies. Traditional educational practices may not include the same ideas of justice and individual rights. Another explanation for the discrepancies between traditional and Western cultures is that the two types of cultures live in different environments. Because of the harsher environment, tribal and village populations have more concerns than justice and individual rights, like, you know, survival. Schwader and colleagues in 1977 argued that Kohlberg's model of moral reasoning only represented one of the three codes that people use for moral judgments around the world. The other, those three are the ethics of autonomy, the ethics of community, and the ethics of divinity. Schwader and his group referred to Kohlberg's model as an ethic, uh, ethic of autonomy. The ethic views morality in uh, terms of individual freedom and rights violations. Uh, an act is seen as immoral under the ethic of autonomy when it directly hurts another person or infringes on another's rights and freedoms as an individual. A second code of ethics that Schwader and uh, colleagues propose, proposes is an ethic of community, which emphasizes that individuals have, have duties that conform with their roles in a community or social hierarchy. 
According to this code, there is an ethical principle to uphold one's interpersonal duties and obligations toward others. Actions are seen as wrong when individuals fail to perform their duties. A third code that Schwader and colleagues suggested was an ethic of divinity, which is concerned with sanctity and the perceived natural order of things. This code contains the ethical principle that one is obligated to preserve the standards mandated by a transcendent authority. Actions are seen as immoral if they cause impurity or degradation to oneself or others, or if one shows any disrespect for God or God's creations. Uh, this is a picture of a riot in, uh, or a demonstration in India. Uh, what happened uh, was that there was a 12-year-old uh, uh, Muslim female uh, who was uh, herding sheep. And uh, the uh, Hindu men in the area decided that she was immoral. So they uh, uh, raped and murdered her. Uh, they gang raped her and mur murdered her. And these are the women that are um, uh, protesting against that type of... And th then they, uh, when they were tried, they were, uh, they were acquitted. And these women were demonstrating afterwards uh, because of... Uh, the fact that they, they thought that that was a travesty of justice. Uh, of course, these kinds of, uh, of uh, uh, moral judgments are, are being done constantly around the world, especially in third world countries. German sociologist Ferdinand Tonys argued that there are two ways that people can relate to each other in a group. Gemeinschaft, the community relationships bind people together with the social glue of concord, and Gesellschaft, people act as individuals and have weak binds with society. Gemeinschaft groups are characteristic of small folk group organizations, and within these groups, interpersonal relationships play an especially important, part, important role. People feel connected to one another because they feel a unity of spirit. The relationships are central to an individual's identity. Obligations associated with one's Gemeinschaft uh, carry weight of full moral obligations. And uh, I personally would think that uh, the Diné people, the uh, Navajo Nation, is probably a Gemeinschaft group uh, because uh, you have Ke, ke I, I don't pronounce it correctly and I apologize, uh, but you have clan, uh, your clan system. Uh, and the clan system, of course, uh, brings people uh, uh, together. And it is uh, the, the clans, clan system uh, that, uh, that people are looking at when they uh, uh, determine what, their, what uh, uh, groups they can interact with and whatnot. Well, not interact with, but intermarry and whatnot. And people that they can't. Gesellschaft... Uh, are groups that are characteristic of modern Western societies and treat relationships as imaginary, instrumental, as a means to an end, of course. Gesellschaft groups are perceived as relatively impersonal and somewhat contractual, uh, which leads to the necessity of justice obligations to govern disputes between individuals. So in a Gemeinschaft situation, it would be society in general that would decide the... Uh, uh, decide the uh, fate of something. Uh, but in a gazelle shaft, uh, the individuals don't do that. They, they need a centralized, they need a government uh, to tell them what to do and to control uh, select people's behavior. In a gazelle shaft groups, uh, individuals can't be expected always to behave in pro-social ways toward others because they have a strong obligation toward them, toward them. So formalized rules are necessary to keep people in line, and that's why they have speed limits. People of the world over feel a moral obligation to their community. Objective uh, obligations, people believe that they have an obligation to act in a certain way, even if there is no official rule or law that requires them to do so. Legitimately regulated, uh, people should be prevented from engaging in a moral uh, violation or they should be punished if they act in such a way. Uh, so uh, an unofficial rule, uh, there, and there is rules about nudity 
but uh, you wouldn't uh, you you uh, even if you had some clothes on but uh, were displaying uh, select areas of your body like your genitalia uh, if you you had all the other areas of your body covered except your genitalia they would still consider that uh, public nudity if you walked around and all of that is uh, legitimately regulated um, you can have all the clothes on in the world, but if you show off your genitalia, uh, then you would probably be arrested. And that is an objective obligation. <clears throat> Even though there's probably, I, uh, most states don't have a, a law that says you can't display your genitalia. Um, well, maybe they do. Mm. Ethic, uh, the ethic of divinity uh, involves a moral code respecting the sanctity of the natural order of things as dictated by a transcendent moral authority. Immoral actions are perceived to violate the natural order of things. Hunter in 1991 proposed that a culture war exists in the United States and that the battle lines are drawn between those who have an impulse toward orthodoxy and those who have an impulse toward progressivism. And of course we saw this uh, in the last election, we saw this in the 2016 election, uh, where there were some people that wanted to be, uh, that, that felt that we, need, we needed to follow a more orthodox uh, way of looking at uh, the government. And that uh, group were the Republicans under, uh, under Donald Trump. Um, and uh, Biden won the election on a more progressive uh, uh, platform and uh, of course uh, that is something that seems to be a constant argument uh, we have uh, politicians who are uh, arguing against uh, something they call wokeness I haven't really found a good definition of wokeness yet so <laughs> it's really kind of confusing to me how they talk about it so much but they have no that uh, but nobody can really explain to you what they're talking about it's just kind of funny uh, but of course, you know, this could start all kinds of, all kinds of wars. Uh, DeSantis in Florida is doing some really strange things uh, with his educational system. And uh, his rationale is that he is uh, combating uh, wokeness. And of course, at the same time, it's hard. F I have never heard him uh, define what wokeness actually is. Religious adherents who are orthodox are committed to the idea of a transcendent authority. This authority is viewed to have existed long before humans and is operating independently of people. This authority is believed to be more knowledgeable and more powerful than all of, the human, than all of human experience. In the orthodox view, this transcendent authority created a moral code and revealed it to human beings in sacred texts. The moral code is perceived to stand across all times and circumstances and should not be altered to accommodate any social changes or individual differences. Individuals in society are expected to adapt themselves to this ordained moral code. Adherents of progressive religions emphasize the importance of human agency in understanding and formulating a moral code. Progressivists reject the view that a transcendent authority reveals itself and its will to humans. They believe that humans play an integral part in the formulation of moral codes. Progressivists believe that because social circumstances change, the moral code must change along with them. In 2007, Haight and Graham expanded Schwader's three moral ethics by expanding it to five. Avoid harm, protect fairness, be loyal to your group, your in-group, respect hierarchy, and achieve purity. This is Graham and this is hate. Avoid harm. People are sensitive to any behaviors that cause harm to others. Protect fairness, uh, they attend closely to whether resources or rights are distributed in a fair way. Uh, loyalty to their in-groups, people are motivated to identify with their in-groups. 
make sacrifices for their in-groups and trust in-group members more than they trust out-group members. And this is one of the things that happened on January 6, 2021, uh, when uh, a group of uh, Trump supporters uh, invaded the Capitol and stopped the uh, uh, counting of the electoral votes. They were, they identified with their in-group, which was, uh, they were um, MAGA people. They made sacrifices for their in-group in, the, in that they broke the law, and they trust their in-groups more than they trust the out-group members. And of course, the people that they trust are the people that, the other MAGA people that were there. Respect hierarchy. People tend to respect hierarchy by admiring their superiors and believing subordinates uh, need to act in accordance with the wishes of authority figures. And achieve purity, reflecting the ethic of divinity. People are motivated to achieve purity and are disgusted at behaviors ruled by the carnal passions, such as lust or gluttony, or by behaviors that suggest contamination of any kind. There is a greater emphasis on faith in Christianity, especially Protestantism, than in Judaism. Membership in Judaism is defined by descent. Traditionally, one becomes Jewish by being born to a Jewish biological mother. While Christianity is based on beliefs, traditional Judaism emphasizes particular practices, such as keeping kosher by avoiding certain foods like pork. Okay, so in order to be a Christian, you have to demonstrate your beliefs. In order to be Jewish, you have to be born to a Jewish mother. Um, uh, Judaism is not really a universal religion. Christianity is. Christianity is looking for converts. But the Jewish faith is not. Jew the Jewish faith wants to only maintain um, their religion uh, through descent. They're not looking for converts. Protestant sect membership is primarily defined by beliefs. One cannot become a member of a church until one publicly accepts their Christian faith as dictated by a specific church and is thus baptized into that church. Christianity has fewer practices and instead places more emphasis on one's private communications with God. Reflecting the differential emphasis in practices and beliefs, a survey asked Jewish and Protestant participants how important practices and beliefs were for being religious. The results revealed that Jewish participants rated practices as more important than beliefs for being religious, whereas Protestants put greater emphasis on beliefs than practices, uh, which means uh, that uh, if uh, having an affair is a sin, uh, as long as you are a believer, then uh, the fact that you're sinning is, is important, but it's not as important. You can still be a Christian, uh, or you can still be a Protestant, uh, by um, as long as you believe. It doesn't really matter uh, what your actions are, what you practice, uh, what, what your practices are, you're, you can still be a good Protestant. In the Jewish faith, it's all practice. It's, uh, the belief isn't as strong. And if you, if, it's interesting because a lot of times, um, a lot of times if you, if you uh, are watching uh, uh, films and they're talking about Jewish people, uh, they may say that they don't really believe in God, uh, but they are a practicing Jew, uh, which means that they are doing all the things that they need to do in order to be Jewish, but they don't really have a strong belief in, in God. Jewish and Protestant participants were asked to, to evaluate a story of a married man con contemplating having an affair with a woman in his office. All participants viewed extramarital liaisons as immoral, but the Protestants saw thinking about having an affair as sinful as having an affair. The Jewish participants limit their moral domain to what people do and not what they think. Now, this is really kind of interesting because during the 1976 election uh, between uh, Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter, Jimmy Carter did a Playboy interview where he admitted to sinning in his, in his mind. He thought about, uh, 
he thought lustfully about other women. And uh, of course, according to Protestant, uh, the Protestant faith, that was, that was really important. Of course, everyone else is going, so you thought about, you looked at somebody and you thought about having sex with her. That's not really that big a deal. But as far as his faith was concerned, and Jimmy Carter is a good Baptist, uh, that, was, that was a sin. That was as much of a sin as doing something. But uh, uh, the other pe people who weren't part of his faith uh, thought that it wasn't that important. And he won the election. So evidently people other than Baptists voted. And maybe they voted for him, too, since he was a good Baptist. Gerald Ford, I think, was an Episcopalian, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, distributing resources. Uh, you can distribute resources by the principle of need, which dictates that resources are directed to those who need them the most. And that is a form of socialism. Distributing resources, a principle of equality, dictates that resources should be shared equally among members of a group. And that is a that is a part of socialism as well. Distributing resources, the principle of equity, states that resources are distributed based on an individual's contributions. The more an individual produces, the more resources they receive. That's like doing piecework at a factory. The more pieces you make, the more money you make. Distributing resources, a social system that rewards individuals on the basis of uh, equity principle is known as a meritocracy, and meritocracies tend to be more common in individualistic societies. They can lead workers to be highly motivated to work hard because their earnings depend on their efforts. When one worker does well, others tend to do worse. Mer mer meritocratic uh, systems tend to breed co uh, competition among workers. One summer I was working at a uh, Automotive Pumps and Parts Factory, uh, and uh, they asked me to do piecework. They asked me if I would, uh, if I would do piecework, and so I, I did, and, and it was, I don't know, 15 pieces for $10 or something. Uh, anyway, I, and, and I doubled, I doubled the, the um, amount that I was supposed to make in an hour. And I'm thinking, well, wow, this is pretty good. I, I can make, I can make a lot of money this way if I don't, I'm not a, a, I'm not working salary. The union came to me and they said, "Hey, look, uh, you're a young, you're a young fella, and you're not going to be here that long since you're only working this summer. Uh, what you're doing is you're ruining the uh, the rate uh, because sure, right now it's 15 pieces for ten dollars, uh, but uh, because you keep doing that and you keep doubling the uh, the rate, uh, then." What will happen when you leave is that they will raise the rate to 30 pieces for $10. Uh, so what we need you to do is to slow down. Uh, so what I did was uh, I was able to uh, make my quota in, uh, in uh, 15 minutes, and then I took the next 45 minutes off. Um, you know, that's not what the management wanted me to do, but the uh, union was very... Um, Adamant that uh, I, I not mess up the, uh, I, I not mess anything up, and I was making the same amount of money, so I wasn't that uh, upset about it. Distributing resources in some organizations, raises are distributed by longevity. This is known as a seniority system. Seniority systems uh, follow the principle of equality because there is no competition between workers. Pay is determined using the same formula for everyone. And if you think about it, the, the military is kind of this way. The longer you're in the service, the more rank that you make. The more rank that you make, the more money that you make. That's the way it works. Uh, if you're a private and you, uh, no matter what you do in the, in the military, you're still going to get private's pay. Uh, you could, uh, well, you can't fly airplanes as a private. Uh, but uh, it doesn't really matter what you do. Um, it's, you still get paid as somebody who's only been in the military for a short period of time. It is often assumed that merit-based merit pay is the way to ensure the greatest amount of effort from one's employees. That may not be true. Japanese workers have, traditional, have traditionally been among the hardest working in the world, 
there tends to be a great deal of uh, volunteer overtime, and many workers never take their vacations. And Japanese companies tend to have more seniority-based pay than American organizations. Social scientists have developed various economic games to measure uh, people's uh, sense of fairness. In the coin flip scenario, you're given $100 that has been given to you instead of another person by means of a coin flip. You can give the other person any portion of the $100, but they will never know that you uh, who you are. So the question is, what do you do? Uh, you've got $100. Uh, you won the $100 just because you're luckier than the other guy. Uh, you won the coin flip. Now you have to decide what to do. So are you going to give the other guy any money at all, at all or are you going to take the whole $100? That's the question that has been asked. And here's what other people did. Uh, this is known as a dictator game, and there are various outcomes. Economic theory dictates, and of course, you know, I'm, I am, I'm a psychologist. I'm not, I'm not a business person. But I've talked to, uh, to uh, uh, Professor Blackwater about this, and uh, he's a little shocked that, uh, this, that the result was the way it was. Because according to economic theory, uh, they dictate that the rational person will give their invisible partner nothing because they will never know who you are and you don't uh, stand to gain anything from that individual. You're just giving away money. And, of course, business principle is that you never give away money. Uh, you keep as much money as you possibly can. Uh, it is the idea of profit. Uh, I was just reading an article uh, about uh, Leon Musk. No, Elon Musk. I'm sorry. <laughs> I got all the letters right. I just got them out of the wrong, in the wrong sequ sequence. Elon Musk has just dropped off the... He's no longer the richest man in the world. I, I didn't read who was a, the richest man, but uh, I found it interesting that uh, we've, we've got this guy in the United States uh, who, is, uh, who is constantly bouncing uh, between being the richest man and the second richest man in, in the world, as strange as that is. But, so, if you're a businessman, you don't give away any money. Curiously, the economic theory almost never happens. Uh, people around the world feel that keeping all the money for themselves is not right, and it just seems fair to give the other person some money. The most common decision that people make is a 50-50 split. When economists found that even Western college students were making irrational decisions in the dictator game by giving away money that would not benefit them, they sought an explanation. This did not fit any economic models that they had developed. Um, it, this is really kind of interesting because I have a former student uh, who um, studied uh, I.O. psychology. He has a Ph.D. in I.O. psychology, and the first job that he took out of college uh, was, with a business, was with a business school. Now, he's a psychologist, okay? Even though he's an I.O. psychologist, uh, he's still a psychologist. So when he went to, to teach at the, uh, at the business college, uh, he was shocked at how greedy uh, his students seemed and how uh, um, focused they were on making profit. So no matter what he tried to teach them, fairness, uh, morality, uh, it didn't take. Uh, and he became disgusted and uh, he, he changed jobs uh, the next semester uh, or the next uh, year and he uh, moved to another college. Uh, in a psychology program, he made half as much money, but he was happier because, well, he's not happy because he doesn't like where he is, uh, but he didn't like where he was before either. He was in Duluth before, and it's so cold up there, and that, then he's in uh, Salem, Massachusetts now, um, and he's looking for another job because Salem, Massachusetts is by the ocean, and, uh, and it's cold, and he's from Bangladesh, and He's not the happiest person in the world, but he's happier being working in its in the psychology department, even though he's making half as much money as he made with uh, at the business school. 
Okay, so it doesn't make any sense to businessmen that people give away their money and they don't get anything for it, uh, but uh, it uh, makes them feel better. Uh, a surprise to everyone, uh, people uh, to everyone, people in the United States average the highest amount of money to the invisible partner in the dictator game. They gave them $47. On the average, they gave them $47. Factors that dictated uh, the concept of fairness included the amount of calories negotiated at market uh, for food and being a member of a world, Christ, uh, a world religion such as Christianity or Islam, uh, where God observes one's fairness. And of course, this is a picture of this guy. God is glaring down at this guy who's peeing in the ocean. Like the fish don't pee in the ocean. Another game is the public goods game. A group of four people are given $10 each. If the individuals donate all their money into a common pool, they are all rewarded with 1.6 times the pot, or $64, and each person gets $16. However, if one person holds their $10 out, the pot only ends up at $48, and they uh, will each get $12. The free rider now has $22, and everybody else has $12. As the number of rounds increased, the researchers found that the group made less and less money because the temptation to be a free rider was just too great, especially for business people. Because of this, the researchers decided to add a new factor to the game. A player could now pay a dollar of their own money and have one of the free riders forfeit three dollars. The players seemed perfectly willing to pay their own money to get another player punished. The researchers found that with the punishment rule, cooperation increased quite dramatically and remained stable across time. The researchers proposed that a key factor that allowed human cooperation to evolve was people's willingness to engage in this kind of altruistic punishment. By feeling motivated to punish those who weren't cooperating, people were able to ensure that group members didn't free ride, which allowed humans to develop norms for cooperation and for large societies to flourish. In other words, to develop government and government rules. When the public goods game was played around the world, altruistic punishment was practiced. However, in, in addition to the tendency for altruistic punishment, in many societies, people showed strong tendencies for what researchers called antisocial punishment. So we've got, we've got altruistic punishment, where they're trying to get some, someone to, uh, uh, to abide by the rules of the game so that everybody benefits. And now we have antisocial punishment. The researchers found that some people, some people were willing to pay their own money to punish another player, even if that player was cooperating. And this was known as antisocial punishment. So it's just being mean to somebody else that you don't like. The motivation for this antisocial punishment seemed to be largely a function of revenge in which people would punish a player who had punished them on a previous round. Revenge. Although this tendency for antisocial punishment was negligible in weird societies, in other societies this behavior predominated. Weird societies are Western uh, economic, uh, anyway, they're, they're Western societies. Antisocial punishment predominates in Oman more than any other country. country. In Oman, of course, Saudi Arabia is that big chunk of, of land just off of the Middle East, and Oman is, is at the uh, tip of it, of uh, that peninsula. Antisocial punishment uh, predominates in Greece as the second highest level measured, and one of the problems with Greece is that they've had economic problems for an extended length of time. Antisocial punishment predominates in Saudi Arabia as the third highest level measured. Saudi Arabia, of course, is that same peninsula as Oman. Antisocial punishment predominates in Russia as the fourth highest level measured in Russia. So we have Russia, we have Greece, we have Saudi Arabia, and we have Oman. And that's it. Uh, the notion that punishment promotes cooperation holds true only in societies characterized by norms for civic cooperation 
and high levels of trust. Antisocial punishment was entirely unexpected by the researchers who first discovered it, but it appears to be quite commonplace in many cultures and it remains somewhat puzzling. The researchers' data show that societies with weaker norms for civic cooperation and a weaker rule of law engaged in more antisocial punishment in public goods games. Other researchers argue that antisocial punishment can be adaptive in contexts where the rule of law is insufficient. In dealing with a system that can't always be trusted to function, people come up with alternative ways to ensure that, that their needs are met. In Brazil, there is a complex sociocultural strategy termed jetimbo, uh, by which people manipulate or dodge the official rules to achieve things. And this is acceptable social behavior. It's like what uh, uh, Trump was talking about in one of his debates with, uh, with Hillary Clinton, I believe. He was saying, everybody cheats on taxes. Well, no, everybody doesn't cheat on taxes on their taxes. As a matter of fact, most people don't cheat on their taxes. But according to him, that's Jetinbo. And of course, he would call you, if you didn't cheat on your taxes, he would call you a sucker or a, or a sap. Now, this is really kind of an interesting picture because this is a picture from, uh, uh, from Brazil. Um, and uh, the reason they're wearing these strange head, headrests is so they can't see the, the person beside them and cheat on the test, uh, as weird as that may seem. Uh, so the, the uh, monitor, the, the test monitor, sits at the front of the room, and he watches them to see if any of these papers flutter. And if they do flutter, they, they uh, can, uh, uh, he, he, he will watch them to see if they're actually cheating. As weird as that is. You, of course, you wouldn't see this in the United States. A real-life example of these weaker norms for civic cooperation can be seen in the game show Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? In the show, which was originally created in the uh, United Kingdom, uh, con contestants are able to use a lifeline and can poll the studio audience for, for help in answering a difficult question. When Who Wants to Be a Millionaire was introduced in Russia, the contestants quickly found out that they couldn't trust the audience. Frequently, the audience members would deliberately choose wrong answers in an apparent effort to mislead the contestants. Remember, Russia was number four in antisocial punishment. So what they're doing is they're purposefully uh, uh, tell, trying to tell them that they uh, the wrong answer as a form of antisocial punishment. What are they punishing them for? For them being on the, the show and, and not the uh, person from the audience. Not unlike the public goods game, many members of the Russian audience seem to be more motivated to sabotage the play of the contestants than to help them. As the Brafman uh, 2009 brothers have said, after a collapse of the Soviet Union, Russians became suspicious of those who were trying to profit off the hard work of others. Norms for civic cooperation remain relatively low in Russia and many other societies around the world, which makes it more difficult for governments to band citizens together in cooperative ventures. This is a picture of a member of uh, Pussy Riot. It's a, a band, a, uh, a performance uh, artist band, uh, and they also make music, of course, but it's a female band in Russia, and they uh, have been around since uh, the around 2010. Uh, they're protesting uh, Vladimir Putin, they're protesting the war, they're protesting uh, the fact that Russia uh, is, be, is, is uh, becoming a uh, oligarchy. And this is pictures of these individuals. This is at the, uh, that's Mbappe, the, uh, the French striker. They were playing against, uh, they were playing against Croatia. And that's a member of Pussy Riot running out on the field. This was a free concert they did in Moscow. 
And of course, they don't want anybody to know who they are because if they knew who they were, they would be arrested and thrown in jail. As a matter of fact, two of them are serving sentences for terrorism, for saying negative things about Vladimir Putin. Anyway, you can listen to their music if you like. Um, uh, Madonna uh, said something about one of their uh, one of their songs a couple of years ago. Anyway, there you go. Um, I apologize for the name of that of that band, uh, but if you want to look them up, they are they are some fascinating people. Of course, they're against the war in Ukraine right now, uh, and that is part of what is going on in Russia. Russia is not the same as the United States. They don't think the same as people in the United States. Uh, Antisocial punishment is, is more common there. Uh, you probably wouldn't see 40, uh, somebody giving away $47 in the dictator game. Anyway, that's, uh, that's the morality uh, that we were talking about before. So I'll talk to you next week. We'll, we will tackle chapter 13, I believe, next week. There's two more chapters. So let me get rid of this.